Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, public webinar on COVID-19 and the evolving terrorist threat challenge and response. This webinar is being organized by the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research, or ICPVTR. ICPVTR is a specialist research center within the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I am Kumar Ramakrishna, and I'm Associate Dean for Policy Studies at RSIS and the head of ICPVTR. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all aspects of life, including politics, health, security, and economics. Within the security sector, the contagion's impact on terrorism and counterterrorism practices has been swift and pronounced. Most terrorist groups across the ideological spectrum have intensified their online propaganda to increase recruitment and plan new attacks. Many governments have had to split available enforcement and economic resources to cope with both the pandemic and the ever-evolving terrorist threat. For instance, while radical Islamist networks such as Islamic State and Al-Qaeda have framed COVID-19 as divine retribution, right-wing ex extremists in the West have used COVID-19 to exacerbate xenophobic attitudes against non-white immigrants and communities, including calling for weaponization of the virus against public infrastructure and law enforcement. Against this backdrop, this webinar will discuss how the global terrorist landscape will evolve in the post-COVID-19 era, as well as how the challenge of the coronavirus will impact counter-terrorism policies and practices in different parts of Southeast Asia and the world. To get the discussion rolling, we have three speakers this afternoon. First up will be Raffaello Pantucci, who is a visiting senior fellow at ICPVTR. Raf is the author of We Love Death as You Love Life, Britain's Suburban Terrorist, which was published by Oxford University Press. Before joining RSIS, Raf was based at the Royal United Services Institute of RUSI in London, where he is currently a senior associate fellow. After that, Raf will be followed by Abdul Basit, who is a research fellow at ICPVTR. Basit specializes in insurgency, terrorism, and political violence in South Asia. He's also the head of the Center's South Asia Desk and associate, associate editor sorry, of the Counter-Terrorist Trends and Analysis Journal, which is a quarterly open access policy journal of terrorism and political violence, which is published by ICPVTR. Finally, our third speaker will be Nur Azima Azman. Azima is an associate research fellow at the center. As the center's informatics team lead, she monitors, translates, and analyzes content on extremist websites and social media platforms with a focus on radical Islamist propaganda and narratives online. I've asked each of my colleagues to speak for about five minutes to set the scene, so to speak, with their opening remarks. And after that, we can have a discussion which will be moderated by me. If you have any questions or comments, please send them via the chat function on Zoom so where I can see it. And I'll do my best to pick up your questions and raise them with the panel. So with that, uh, over to you, Raf. Thanks, Kumar. Uh, and thank you, uh, RSAS colleagues, for organizing uh, this uh, webinar. Um, it's a real pleasure to do this from lovely, sunny Singapore, um, and I'm delighted to hear that there are colleagues from all over the world who are actually joining this call. So um, my, I'm going to speak today to an article that I wrote for the last edition of CTTA, which is trying to look forwards to understand what the impact of COVID-19 and its wider fallout might be on counterterrorism practice. Um, because, as Prof Kumar said, we're keeping our comments to about five minutes. I'm only going to touch on a few top lines, um, and I'm going to touch briefly on some of the sort of how I think the ideology might evolve going forwards. Um, but I really want to leave the space open for our discussion subsequently, um, and I'd look forward to hearing people's comments and, of course, hearing my colleagues' undoubtedly excellent presentations uh, when they come in a minute. So I think there's really two things uh, that we need to think about when we're thinking broadly about COVID-19. Um, and particularly its impact on terrorism and counter-terrorism practice. The first is the big buzzword which we hear a lot talking around COVID-19, which is the acceleration of trends that has taken place as a result of the virus and its fallout. And we see that in a vast range of different areas. Trends that were going on before have been accelerated. And we can see that in the counter-terrorism space, where I would argue a trend towards diffusion and a sort of increasing 
almost democratization, if you will, of sort of terrorist ideologies and methodologies has been even further sort of zoomed forwards. So I think acceleration and diffusion are two of the sort of key adjectives to think about. Now, I think what the other thing which is going to really impact, I think, counterterrorism practice uh, within uh, the sort of uh, as a result of the COVID-19 and its fallout is on resources. And I think resources are going to become under greater pressure across governments as governments find themselves, A, having tax you know, receipts vastly reduced, having a global sort of economic slump and the impact that has on GDP, and the amount of money that therefore is available to be spent on security. On the second side of the coin, you have to also bear in mind that, of course, people's risk perceptions will shift. Whereas previously, people would sort of look at pandemic threats and pandemic diseases as something which were kind of a, you know, a vague threat that sat on the horizon. And depending really on where you lived in the world, you'd sort of either experienced it recently, if you were sitting in Asia and seen sort of SARS or H1N1. But if you're sitting in Europe, you basically would look at this situation and say, well, this is a sort of potential threat, but, you know, not really one that's going to impact us. And that has an impact on public perceptions. And so that means that there will be a push to put much more resource towards dealing with those threats. And consequently, that will reduce, mean there will have to be a reduction in dealing with some of the other threats, including terrorism and countering violent extremism. Now, the impact that that's going to have is going to be very complicated because what it means on the one hand, if you think about the sort of hard end of a counterterrorism response, that will probably be able to proceed. And in fact, I would argue that counterterrorism response um, in terms of sort of police and security agencies and technical tools will probably benefit from the current situation. Tools that are undoubtedly being developed now will be useful to counterterrorism practitioners. So, you know, developing uh, applications, mapping societies, understanding how sort of communities are interacting with each other, tracking people's movements. The technology that's going to develop there is potentially going to be a huge benefit to counterterrorism practitioners. But on the other side of the coin, when we're trying to think about dealing some of the underlying issues that, uh, you know, why people are being motivated towards terrorist ideas and ideologies in the first place, you're looking often at sort of human experiences. You're looking often at very deep seated problems that frankly require substantial resource to be able to manage. And if you really want to go down and understand exactly where these issues are coming from, you're talking about sort of changing, you know, far away countries in really quite fundamental ways, all of which will be a very expensive thing to do. And it will be expensive, not only in terms of the resource that, you know, Western countries can maybe invest in these places to try to deal with these problems, but it will also mean that in those countries will also suffer from the global slump in GDP and not necessarily have the resources to be able to tackle some of these problems at home. So I think some of the underlying issues that are driving people towards terrorist ideas and ideologies will potentially be uh, left alone and will get worse. On top of this, I think the question of um, acceleration um, is going to ha have... Uh, major repercussions in the societal tension space, where we can see already that communities are coming under fire. We can already see, you know, if we, if we just look at the sort of the narratives in the United States, where we can see the anti-government narrative has really taken off. Uh, we've seen people launching all sorts of attacks or planned attacks or attempting attacks on government as government sort of expands its response. And this is very much an evolution of kind of the patriot movement that we've seen in the past that evolved into the kind of sovereign citizen that a land movement in the U.S., um, but we can also see, you know, the inequalities are going to increase and inequalities means you create these sort of fissures in societies that terrorist groups can offer easy answers to, uh, which will therefore, you know, give them a ripe uh, recruiting ground uh, to sort of push their ideologies forwards. So I think on that side of the equation, the prevent space, dealing with the kind of underlying issues which are motivating people towards um, ideologies will become much harder to mobilize resources to deal with. And on the other hand, the kind of space, the fractured space within societies that means terrorist groups are able to sort of mobilize within that um, is going to become much worse. Uh, the final point I'll briefly touch upon, uh, trying to stick within my uh, rigid five minute rule that uh, Prof Kumar set us at the beginning, is that I think we need to think forwards about some of the ideologies that might emerge as a result. I know colleagues are going to touch on some of the sort of existing ideologies that are out there and how they've responded to the threats. But I think projecting forwards, understanding what is the next evolution that we're going to see in, uh, you know, uh, non-state violence and what that might look like. We've seen an explosion in use of technology to communicate and function in uh, this period of time. Uh, for example, this very webinar is a product of, you know, the sort of times that we live in. And yet this sort of uh, push towards technology is going to create its own malcontents. It's going to create 
potentially uh, vast reams of people who are losing their jobs or living their livelihoods as a result of this surge in technological advance. Um, we also see people who sort of push back against this kind of technologicalization of society, a kind of Luddite, a neo-Luddite movement might emerge. Um, and if we look to other sorts of ideologies that we can see that have been brewing around for a while, sort of micro ideologies that have managed to take advantage of the interconnected world to bring together communities across the world rather than sort of just within physical communities to bring them together and mobilizing them, how they will kind of develop and draw out of uh, the societies that we see coming from um, the post-COVID world. Um, and on top of that, I think the final point I will very briefly say is that we are unfortunately also moving into a world where global cooperation around security questions is going to increasingly become under question. We can see the major kind of geopolitical clash at the moment between the United States and China is slowly spreading its tentacles into every kind of space of our um, of uh, interaction and uh, in, in the world in general. And that is going to undoubtedly have some sort of overspill um, and ultimately cause problems in trying to mobilize, um, you know, not just that clash, but the other clashes and other conflicts that might engender as a result of that to try to mobilize international security cooperation, um, I think to deal with problem, transnational problems like terrorist groups will I think become much more complicated because of the resource requirements, but also because of the sort of divisions that we can see brewing um, at the moment. So with that, I will pause uh, and I will hand it back to Kumar, um, who I think, or, or hand it straight on to Basit. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Raf, uh, for getting us uh, off to a good start for our discussion, uh, that overview of uh, some of the challenges we are facing. Uh, right now, I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Abdul Basit, to chip in as well at this point. Basit. Thanks, Prof. Kumar. Thanks, Raf. Uh, so I'll be uh, touching on how global jihadist groups and the Afghan Taliban have responded to uh, the situation of COVID-19. As you know that uh, terrorist groups are uh, manipulative and you know they have a very complex uh, incentive structure. Uh, so they, 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 that opportunistic uh, nature of these groups uh, put them in a situation that they can create a win-win uh, situation out of any uh, uh, condition or, or, or predicament. Same as in the case with COVID-19. So when the pandemic started from China, the initial response of the Islamic State was that this is a God's punishment for the on the communist for you know mistreating the Muslim in or Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. Uh, but when uh, the, the the virus geographical spread of the virus reached uh, Iran, uh, they were saying, "Oh, this this is God's wrath against uh, the Shiite Muslims uh, for their apostasy and their practices which corrupts Islam and the impurities they bring in." Uh, when it read uh, Europe, uh, they were uh, having a different narrative that it is God's wrath against the infidels for waging a war against Islam and waging a war against uh, the Mujahideen. Uh, so uh, ISS uh, take, took a very, very radical uh, and absolute view of the pandemic. But on the other hand, if you look at how Al-Qaeda and the Taliban responded uh, to the pandemic, they used it for a PR uh, exercise as a PR campaign. Uh, and that is also very opportunistic. So if you look at Al-Qaeda's message, Al-Qaeda is, while they call the pandemic or the virus as God's little soldier, uh, they also invite the Western audience to study Islam uh, during the time of the quarantine and invite them towards Islam. Taliban, on the other hand, they have their political agenda as well as they have uh, their things going on on the battlefield. So apparently what Taliban have done is that they kind of, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at the surface, they are extending uh, offers of cooperation to the government uh, that we can work together uh, in fighting COVID-19. Uh, so they offered a conditional truce to the Afghan government in areas affected by COVID-19. Just to uh, uh, make a point that after COVID-19, the largest uh, cross-border movement uh, of people took place from Iran to Afghanistan. So over 100,000 people from Iran came to Afghanistan untested. Uh, most of them came to the Herat province, uh, which has which created a lot of issues and challenges uh, for, for the Afghan government. Uh, so, so Taliban were saying in areas affected by COVID-19, we can have a conditional uh, 
uh, ceasefire. Also, they restored the security guarantees of uh, International Committee of Red Cross, other INGOs, uh, allowing them to work in Taliban controlled areas. But at the same time, if you look at it, at one hand, they are offering this truce. On the other hand, they are carrying on with their attacks, but they are not publicizing them. So it's not that they have given up on violence. The violence is pretty much there. It's just that that they're not publicizing that violence. Also, Taliban were refraining from attacking urban areas of Afghanistan. But recently, we saw an attack on a maternity hospital in Kabul, which is unclaimed. Nobody claimed that attack. Now, that is perhaps their way of continuing to hit urban areas, but not to claim those attacks. So I think in overall sense, if you look at how these global jihadists have responded to uh, the situation is they have tried to fit in uh, these this situation into their ideological narrative for ideological substantiation and 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 uh, you know further their propaganda. Uh, one point I would like to touch, which Raf mentioned about technology, that the use of technology is informing governments uh, in terms of policing, maintaining security, and going forward, this could help them. Uh, you know, in counterterrorism and uh, surveillance of, of the militants. At the same time, the, the flip side of this uh, greater technological uh, penetration as we move towards, uh, you know, automation and artificial intelligence, uh, as well as a use of drones and robots is that commercially available technology can be modified. Al-Qaeda and ISIS have done this uh, before, so they could use drones for their own purposes as well. I mean, if drones are will be used say, for instance, surveillance of people who are under quarantine for disinfection sprays or for food supplies, same drones could be used by these militants uh, for, for attacks or for their own uh, carrying surveillance of their own. So I think there is a flip side to it as well. So we need to, we need to ask this question uh, you know, at our level, at, in, in our discussions, that how do we move forward in terms of uh, providing license and the laws which are governing uh, the technological sector. Uh, my last point is that uh, COVID-19 resulted in an explosion of uh, social uh, online propaganda on different social media platforms. Uh, these militants were smart enough to spot that most of the people will be spending their time on social media. Uh, and in this time of uncertainty, when anxieties are really high and they are looking for answer, this is where they are trying to spot vulnerable individuals. So. Uh, going forward, once uh, this uh, uh, pandemic is over or we stem over the tide of the of the virus, uh, uh, keeping an eye on online militant recruitment is one area uh, where attention should be uh, should be paid. Lastly, uh, if resources are going to go in other sectors, human security, health security, economic security, etc., and funding and counterterrorism is going to decline, something that uh, Raf mentioned, then we have to think about more innovative and cost-effective ways of counterterrorism. One way of doing it in the technological sector could be government and social media companies working together to make sure that these spaces are not used uh, by terrorists uh, as they have done in the past uh, for their heinous purposes. Uh, I'll stop here and uh, then I look forward to a an engaging discussion. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, uh, Basit. Uh, our final uh, speaker for this afternoon uh, is actually uh, Azima. Azima, unfortunately, has not been uh, very well, so she will keep her remarks short and she will try to uh, uh, remain with us. Uh, but Azima, <laughs> can you just uh, briefly share some of your points or ideas? Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'll try to be brief, um, seeing that I might have to uh, run to the toilet <laughs> in a bit. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you Raf and Basit for your input. Uh, for my part, I will highlight the three main uh, narratives or extremist narratives uh, that trickle down from uh, what ISIS has been saying uh, in, uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so there are three main narratives, uh, as what I'm going to say might, might overlap with what Basit and what uh, Ralph has already said, uh, but the first one is uh, the divine retribution or the divine punishment. Now this narrative has been going around even before ISIS, um, <clears throat> even before ISIS started to uh, disseminate or uh, propagate uh, this narrative. Um, because 
the extremists in general believe that whatever happened, uh, whatever disastrous calamities that happen uh, in in any countries, those are basically punishment for um, the so-called infidels or apostates and, and so on. But what divine retribution, uh, the, the, the divine retribution narrative here uh, reinforces is the anti-Chinese and the xenophobic sentiment as well as, as the anti-Shiite uh, sentiments um, that later came. Um, and because of these narratives, uh, we see a lot of uh, racist discussions uh, being made in uh, social media platforms, in Telegram and in Facebook and so on. But uh, on the ground, it doesn't seem the, the, the uptick of um, the uptick of uh, violence against the Chinese doesn't seem to match with the uh, discussions online, but uh, then again, it is still uh, a trend that needs to be um, monitored. Uh, so, for the second, um, for the second narrative is the assertion of uh, guidelines uh, of having to stick to the guidelines based on the Sharia. This is something that was being uh, propagated by um, by ISIS. Uh, so. Um, what they what they firstly say would be um, not to believe in um, other agencies or what the government has been telling uh, telling us what to do uh, because we believe that um, since the virus comes from God so you have to turn to God to um, to handle it so this resulted in um, discussions in social media platforms saying that uh, we shouldn't adhere to the government's uh, lockdown measures and so on. Uh, so we see that people protesting against the closure of mosques, um, against uh, gatherings and, and so on. So this is the second uh, narrative. Uh, the third one is the exploitation of disorder and, and panic uh, uh, resulting from the, the pandemic and the outbreak. Um, so basically, it urges um, individuals to continue and even intensify operations and so on. Now, uh, this can be seen in, uh, let's say, for example, the MIT or the Mujahideen Indonesian Timur in Indonesia ramping up their activities. Um, in, in the month of April itself, they've been uh, quite active and they've even um, posted videos showing the headings of um, farmers they claim to be spies. And uh, the, the, leader, the, the leader himself, Ali Kalura, even said that um, soon the, the Tawud or the oppressors, uh, who meaning here the police, uh, would be defeated by, uh, by the pandemic, by the virus itself, because they considered them as allies, as far as allies. Uh, so these are basically the three main narratives. Of course, um, there are many spin-offs from from this uh, that can be that might that we might be seeing um, more of in in social media platforms. Um, but nevertheless, we have to um, monitor the kind of discussions uh, that they're having uh, <clears throat> because of uh, the pandemic. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to any discussions or any questions that you have uh, regarding uh, the narratives that I've just mentioned or other narratives that you might have uh, found on social media that we might have missed. Um, that's it. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. You've had uh, three uh, excellent colleagues uh, from ICPVTR sharing their insights uh, on their assessment of uh, how COVID-19 has uh, impacted the transnational terrorism threat. Uh, I'd like to remind all of you, uh, please uh, do uh, join in the discussion by posting your questions on the uh, online Zoom chat. I can see the chat box and uh, I will do my best to get your questions to the panel. Uh, first off, uh, as you guys are thinking about the questions you'd like to ask, uh, maybe I'll just get the ball rolling by asking the, uh, the panel the kickoff question. Uh, recently, uh, last month in April, there was uh, an attack by the uh, Abu Sayyaf group on the armed forces of the Philippines uh, a unit, which was in fact, uh, according to the Philippine military, a very serious attack, or the most serious incident since the uh, church bombings in Yolo in January 2019. Uh, at, a, at the same time, in uh, Indonesia, there was an attack uh, on the police by uh, 
uh, elements of the East Indonesia Mujahideen group. So I was wondering, uh, does the panel think, uh, it's not just confined to Southeast Asia, but in general, do you see, uh, uh, do you think that we should expect a significant uptick in attacks by uh, terrorist groups around the world in response to COVID-19? It's, in, line, uh, it's uh, in line with what Rev was saying at the beginning because of the distraction. COVID-19 is a strategic distraction for the security and intelligence agencies. So, uh, right now, there is a window of vulnerability which uh, all governments and societies need to be aware of as far as the threat of terrorism is concerned. So perhaps I'll just throw that out there and, uh, you know, you guys can chip in. Sure. Um, I'm happy to maybe try to get us going um, before uh, Basit and Nazima uh, chime in. Else. So, I mean, look, I think it's a, it's a really uh, interesting question, Prof, and I think it does uh, touch on, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem in some ways of COVID and when we put that up against all the other threats that are out there. The real problem is all the other threats haven't gone away, <laughs> you know, and one could actually argue that in some cases they are made worse as a result of this. Now, the ones you mentioned in, in the Philippines and Indonesia, I would argue that terrorism in general in Southeast Asia, and I think some of my colleagues um, at ICPVTR are much more attuned to these issues than are, than I am, you know, have been getting worse and really escalating in a very gradual way for some time. Um, and so I think that trajectory is sort of continuing. And it's really, I think, a question of, um, you know, problems indigenously, um, potentially a problems of returnees from Syria and Iraq, which, you know, is still a threat that we haven't really seen mature, I think, in the way that everyone's expecting it to. But I think that's because we're thinking on too short a timeline. Everyone's expecting the war in Syria ends, Baghouz falls, and these guys flood back home, and then suddenly we see a surge in attacks. I'd argue, why have we seen that happen before anywhere else? Every other jihadi battlefield that's had people drawn to it, it actually takes a little while for the threat to evolve uh, back home. Uh, as those people make it back, as we see people at home who are radicalized and who can't go to the battlefield actually launch attacks. So I think, in a way, that trajectory hasn't been stopped by COVID, it will continue. And so I think what we're just seeing is that gradually kind of maturing um, as time goes along. I think the other point I'd make is maybe a quick reference to um, what we've seen. And I think Basit touched upon this a bit in, in some of his, uh, his excellent presentation about how uh, you know, you're seeing groups react to this, which they, some of them are saying, you know, now is the moment to strike. <laughs> You know, and I think we've seen that in terms of ISIS narratives in, uh, in parts of the West. They've said, you know, now is exactly the moment that we should be doing kind of lone actor attacks. Um, but then also we've seen in places like uh, the Sahel, for example, Al-Qaeda has been talking much more loudly about the fact that, you know, forces in Mali are very distracted. Uh, the United States is drawing down in some places. We've seen Al-Shabaab say similar things. They're really kind of ramping up their rhetoric of saying, take advantage of this situation because our adversaries are kind of on the back foot. So now press forward's the advantage. So, you know, I would argue that really it's, again, it's not so much a, a new thing that's going to come. It's more an evolution of what happened before, um, which was just sort of happening already. And now we'll go up. The problem is our response is going in kind of the opposite direction. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just we're rat left. So is, is there going to be an uptake of violence? I think, in addition to COVID-19, which is an opportunity definitely for these groups because the attention of various states engaged in various counter-terrorism alliances around the world uh, are now occupied on the health front. Uh, alongside that, I think two important um, developments we need to keep in mind is in two very important theaters where generally and historically terrorism has emanated, particularly jihadist violence. One is Afghanistan, the other is Iraq. The American military footprint in both theaters is decreasing. Uh, expectedly, if America keeps to its timeline of withdrawal, which was agreed with the Taliban in, in, the, in, in the deal they signed with the Taliban in Doha in February, by July of this year, uh, most of the NATO troops and American troops will withdraw from Afghanistan. Now that leaves the battle space open for the Taliban and they can take tactical advantages of it. Now, Taliban under the deal with, with America agreed to reduce violence in Afghanistan's urban areas. But then Islamic State of Khorasan, which is the official branch of the Islamic State in Afghanistan, 
they are using that opportunity uh, and they are trying to you know claim the urban space of terrorism in afghanistan generally the haqqani network used to strike in afghanistan's urban areas but currently if you look at the major attacks funeral attack in 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 nangarhar a uh, couple of attacks in kabul is isk has claimed that now that really creates a competition with the taliban and that forces taliban to do the same maybe perhaps the unclaimed attack on 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 the hospital uh, is because of that likewise if you look at uh, if you look in iraq uh, uh, um, isis uh, uh, number of attacks per week have really really increased so i think that tells you and then we are now hearing the news of prison breaks in in um, uh, in those parts of the world as well so i think if you look at it in overall sense uh, because america is uh, reducing its foot it, it its military footprint in afghanistan and iraq uh, the the terrorism is likely to go up and as raf said that it takes time for these trends to mature and then the way it it kind of germinates towards other countries we need to wait and see but definitely there have been attempts uh, to carry out attacks and already because space is free for these big groups and they can set the trends and other people kind of copy those tactics uh, so i think going forward terrorism is going to uh, to increase yeah thanks thanks wasit for those comments uh, what about azima you want to add anything here south asia uh I think Azima uh, ah, is back. Sorry, okay. Azima. Uh, uh, do you see an uptick uh, of terrorist uh, incidents in the Southeast Asia region because of COVID nineteen? Uh, from what you see online, you see anything? Well, I think um, with regard to Indonesia in particular, um, or maybe because this is in the month of Ramadan as well, when they you know they take advantage of of the holy month to do to conduct uh, conduct this kind of jihad activities uh, <clears throat> so they they tend to grab the opportunity of being in ramadan and also the 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 pandemic to the virus so uh i mean i see mit has ramped up the activity that is that is one thing and and the fact that um that in in the philippines also uh, operations from crisis groups continue to uh, to be carried out uh but that is i believe that, i mean that is regardless of the regardless of the um the pandemic they would still they would still go on with with such operations it's just that they they using the covid as as um as a new context for their extremist activities so in my opinion um regardless of the the virus uh terrorism still still continues in these south areas if key key factors or key drivers that uh that pushes them to to continue doing it are not being addressed um i think it will continue to go on thanks she in this connection uh, azima there was a question from the uh, audience mm -hmm. uh zulfika from a uh, jad in indonesia was recently arrested and uh uh essentially the question is uh, is this a uh, indication that uh, there's going to be a, a likely uptick in uh, a threat to the ethnic chinese in indonesia because you know of the uh, association of the virus with uh, china mm -hmm. and did you do detect anything on uh, online in your assessment oh, definitely uh, the anti chinese um, racist discussions uh, have gone up uh, definitely uh, but uh, i mean if if uh, what Azufika from JAD um I mean the trend set by Azufika from JAD is going to be emulated I mean it's it's still possible but um we don't see we, we don't see um sort of tangible or concrete plans online to to do specific targeting uh or at least that's online but on the ground it could be um another case but online definitely the discussion is more on like uh okay we I mean, they 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 target like uh, in general, uh, but they never really specifically um, target like a oh, one person, one group, uh, which has been done before with the police in 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 the chat rooms. Uh, I mean, previously they would like like post photos and in, uh, personal information of certain uh, 
uh, targets uh, online, but nowadays not anymore. So in terms of, of that, uh, I mean, we have yet to see, we have yet to see how this is going to manifest on the ground. But of course, online, we have to uh, remain, uh, remain vigilant and monitor uh, how the discussion is going. Thanks, thanks. Another set of uh, questions, uh, if I may uh, combine them, uh, relates to the issue of weaponization of the virus. A couple of uh, participants uh, expressed this uh, concern that, uh, uh, so the panel, uh, do you uh, feel that the, this issue of the weaponization of the virus through deliberate spreading of the virus amongst vulnerable populations is something uh, which uh, we should be paying attention to? And maybe I ask uh, perhaps Raf to chip in here. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, this is something that we've seen a lot of talk about. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of chatter on far right wing forums in particular, where they talk about, you know, going to cough, uh, you know, Jews or going to synagogues and spreading the disease in some way. Um, so we have seen that a lot. I think there's also been a plot that was disrupted in Tunisia, where it seemed as though the sort of imam of a group or an emir of a group was telling his followers, you know, if you have the disease, you should use it, go and spread it amongst the kafirs. So we've seen a lot of discussion about this. But, you know, I don't know that we've seen much realization of it. Um, and I think that's really the key. I think you've got a lot of talk, and this is always the problem with, you know, when you look at uh, some of the forums, there's a lot of chatter that these groups have and a lot of things that they say they're going to do, but then when they actually come down to it, they tend to fall back into sort of the obvious pattern of activity um, in terms of what they're actually trying to do. And actually the activity is, of course, a lot less um, than the rhetoric. So I think it's a, it's a concern, and it's a concern that people are paying attention to, but I'm not sure it's a concern that's really matured yet. Um, I'd also add a brief codicil if I could, because I, I see questions that are looking at uh, questions of sort of bioweapons. Now, I think that bioweapons have been a sort of consistent thing that people have worried about terrorists moving towards. And I think certainly in the past few years, we've seen an increase in use of chemical weapons or attempts to use chemical weapons by terrorist groups. But I think bioweapons are different to chemical weapons because bioweapons, you know, the, the way that it would sort of appear, the way that you would have to deploy it, a, it requires a certain level of technical sophistication to develop such a tool and then control it and then be able to disseminate it. But then also the way it would show up is not really necessarily the same sort of impact that you'd get from a chemical weapon attack or a bomb or a shooting or a stabbing where you have a kind of a big event that then attracts attention. You know, a bioweapon might evolve in much the same way that we saw COVID evolve, which was it appeared in a Chinese city. No one really knew what was happening for a long time. Eventually, they figured out something was up. It started to show up around the world. And so at what point does the group kind of claim responsibility for this? You know, at what point do they have that kind of big moment that they can say, look what we've done? You know, and so I, I think that that complicates in some ways why a bioweapon would be a useful uh, tool for groups. So having said all of that, I think, you know, the accessibility and the threshold of technological access to some of these tools is clearly going down. And that is, I think, quite worrying. Hmm. How about you, Basit? Do you see uh, any uh, tendency towards uh, deliberate, deliberate weaponization of the virus in the uh, South Asian context? What do you think? Um, not really. I mean, as Raf said, that the, the chatter is there. The conversations are there. Uh, maybe there are a couple of failed attempts uh, uh, by militants as well. But I think uh, in this situation, uh, uh, in my own opinion, and I could be wrong here, that uh, it would be difficult to weaponize the virus because the entire attention of the exactly. world is towards stopping uh, the, the, the spread of the virus. So if someone is trying to cough, you know, most of the governments have really announced uh, penalties for not uh, uh, following social distancing norms and other SOPs that different governments have announced. So if you're not maintaining social distancing, if you are not cuffing properly in your, uh, you know, in your sleeves or using a handkerchief, et cetera, uh, you could be caught. So these, these are suspicious activities. To the contrary, if they use the, the conventional methods of terrorism, for instance, stabbing, vehicular ramming, we have seen such incidents uh, reported in uh, different areas of Paris, uh, and uh, they, they were successful in terms of the, these were low end attacks. So uh, they, the, but the terrorists managed to kill in one attack, like two people injured five others. One was using his car to, uh, you know, attack the, uh, the, the French police. So I think in such situation when security forces are exposed 
they are in public places trying to maintain um, uh, the social distancing norm put in place by the governments so that the more, more traditional methods of terrorism might be more effective rather than you know uh, weaponizing the virus because it's fancy talk um, it it is uh, it is in the trend, so it's quite cool to talk about it. But can they really materialize uh, effectively and use uh, the virus as a weapon in future? Uh, I think if they do so, uh, they might end up, uh, you know, adding uh, a lot of resentment towards uh, them. Because if the if the world is trying to get rid of virus and some terrorist groups are keeping the virus by infecting some of their people. Uh, this COVID-19 struggle will go on and people would like to return to normalcy. So I think the talk is there. Uh, I haven't seen any practical steps so far, successful practical step that they have been able to weaponize it. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, questions I see on the, the, the chat screen is an interesting question, which is uh, actually related to what I wanted to uh, raise as well. This whole issue of the connection between uh, divine retribution, the theme of divine retribution and extremist ideology. Mm. So, uh, do any of you have any thoughts about this uh, connection? Does this COVID-19 outbreak provide more grist for the extremist ideological mill? Uh, what, what do you think? May anybody want to chip in? Anybody can do so? Yes, uh, Zima, yes. Yeah, uh, like I've mentioned before, this divine retribution narrative is not new. Uh, because in the past, uh, see for instance, uh, I think the past few years when there were quite a lot of like earthquakes and volcano, uh, volcano eruptions in the Philippines, um, the tsunami in Palu and all that, they, they've always labeled them as divine retribution. So um, I, I don't see that this divine retribution narrative is uh, going to be temporary. Uh, I mean, as long as there's any kind of calamities happening, um, they will always bring up mm. divine retribution. Basically, the idea of retribution. If you do, if you do something, uh, something wrong, uh, something, uh, if you commit atrocities, uh, oppress people, then you're going to be punished. You're going to be, you're going to be punished by God. So, and and uh, natural disasters and calamities serve as the that sort of the best uh, kind of manifestation of this mm. divine, of this retribution and it comes because it's you cannot control it you you cannot sort of foresee uh, uh, this uh, kind of um, disasters to be happening in a way uh, so it, it, it is it is um, it's not temporary it will always be uh, bringing, bringing this narrative back uh, to and also to, I mean, in a way, they, it, they are opportunistic to, to use this narrative to, um, to incite uh, fear or rage or uh, certain kind of uh, sentiments that would, that would be against um, their so-called enemies or adversaries. Right. Sorry, Raf, I want to say something as well. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think uh, Azima made the, the case very clearly. I would just say that you know, looking beyond uh, kind of Islamist um, ideologies, I think what's interesting is if you look at terrorist groups more generally, eschatological narratives, the kind of end of days, the apocalypse coming, you know, that is a very key narrative that you see really across ideologies. You know, and ultimately groups are trying to, you know, overthrow an established order and kind of start afresh and rebuild a new order out of it. And so that has a very strong sense of kind of end of days. So within that, the idea of a kind of a pestilence <laughs> like we're seeing with the COVID-19 sweeping across the world you know, clearing all out before it does really play to that narrative. And I think this is a kind of an ideological element that I think is interesting to look at, not just in the context of the kind of Islamist narrative of divine or religious narratives of divine retribution, but actually in other narratives as well, where, you know, if you think about groups like the QAnon uh, movement or group or whatever you want to call it, which has it, it's kind of, you know, this sort of end of days thing coming um, at its core. If we look at some of the extreme right, which is talking about, you know, cleansing society in these sort of dramatic ways. This kind of world which is dealing, confronting with the kind of existential crisis that COVID-19 or a pandemic poses, it really does play to their kind of narratives of what's kind of happening in the world and the kind of realization of what they've been shouting about all this time. Mm. Thanks. Uh, what about you, uh, Basit? Do you have any... I mean, 
I mean, I'll, I'll just say that uh, it's quite uh, easy for these groups to invoke uh, the, yeah. the will of God uh, into right. any any situation and uh, frame it uh, as 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 they please. I mean, look at ISIS. Uh, first, ISIS thought that oh, this wrath of God or divine retribution is against the communist Chinese for what they have done to Uyghur Muslims. Mm. Then it went to Iran, and it still suited them. They they just framed the Shia practices of Islam uh, within that narrative. Later on, they were looking at the West, and they said, oh, this is mm. against the infidels. Now, um, very, I would have been not surprised that if. COVID-19 had really affected any of these groups in a major way, rather than calling it the divine retribution, they would have simply called it a test of God. God was testing them. <laughs> so it's, at, I think, you know, ideology is, is sure. one thing which is static and the way you use it for your strategic <laughs> purposes is um, they, are, they are quite, uh, uh, you know, they, the art of uh, manipulation is uh, quite good with these groups. So. Uh, they, they will continue doing it as the situation will evolve. The, the narrative will continuously evolve with it. Hmm. One of the thanks, guys. Uh, interesting question we have. Uh, you know, it's a kind of like uh, going to the other side of the spectrum where you know we've just discussed how COVID nineteen could actually give a, a boost in the uh, extremist narrative space. But on the other side of the spectrum, could COVID nineteen actually create some space for? Uh, uh, on the other hand, conflict resolution, you know, yeah. peaceful cons conflict resolution. Uh, for example, the tsunami in Aceh in 2004 created the conditions for a peace uh, arrangement and ultimate uh, ending decades of conflict. So you think, uh, is it a possibility that in some parts of, of the world, you see a possibility where the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic may create a, a sense of a uh, soul searching across the board on and push various groups to towards a negotiating uh, table. Do you do you see that uh, as a, another possibility? Is some uh, somebody just asked? I mean, uh, if I look at Afghanistan, uh, definitely COVID nineteen has created a very paradoxical situation, both for peace as well as for violence. Uh, if you look at the Taliban. Um, if they really increase their violence and they claim it, the, currently they are not claiming most of their attacks, mm. uh, people would see them as troublemakers. But on the contrary, because now they are at this stage where from insurgency they are evolving as a political actor in Afghanistan as well, if they, 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 they behave maturely uh, in the political sense, uh, they are going to create some space for themselves within the international community. Uh, so that is going to affect their behavior if there are some serious thinker within that uh, Taliban movement. Uh, uh, likewise, if you look at the Afghan government, Afghan government uh, uh, at, at one stage, the, it is reluctant to talk to the Taliban. But at the same time, if they don't talk to them, half of the country is under the Taliban control. And if they do not cooperate, then COVID-19 is going to stay in Afghanistan in one way or the other. So COVID-19 has created a situation where they have to do, you know, work together on some areas. And that the, those areas are going to create those confidence building measures, much needed confidence building measures between the Afghan government and the Taliban that could help them. This kind of cooperation may help both parties to remove some bad blood they have with, with each other. And going forward, it may help them talk out various issues. So I think the situation is there, the opportunity in Afghanistan is there, but are they ready to, are they ready to, you know, uh, seize on that opportunity is another question. That's right, issue of political will. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, um, uh, yep, yeah, please, Raf. No, I, I was just going to very briefly say, I think, you know, I think, um, I think Basit kind of, in his quick description of Afghanistan, kind of hit the nail on the head. We did have the UN Secretary General make an open call early in the crisis about how armed groups should, you know, maybe now is the moment to seek a truce. And we did see some say yes and take advantage of that. I think the one that specifically sprung to mind was the ELN in Colombia. But I also know the ELN have said that, well, we put a truce forwards. We don't think the government reciprocated and therefore we think we're going to go back to violence. So I think that it's possible, but I, I, I tend towards 
the fact that unfortunately, I go back to what I mentioned in my presentation, which is the global context at the moment does seem much more towards conflict than cooperation. Even if we look at the virus response and the development of a vaccine, we're not seeing a kind of global get together of everyone pooling resources to try to develop a vaccine for the world. We're seeing different countries in a kind of race against each other to get there first. Um, and so to me, that doesn't speak to a world that's in an environment where, frankly, cooperation um, to deal with issues that, frankly, are all of our problems together. Uh, people don't seem to be, unfortunately, pulling in that direction. So I think that global context is going to complicate any kind of violent uh, militant context as well. Right. Thanks. Uh, qu interesting question uh, just came in. Uh, do you, it's, it's an issue about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the uh, preparedness and the uh, readiness of the security and uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, we may have touched on this briefly, but uh, does the panel feel that uh, with having to dis uh, distribute resources between uh, having to deal with the outbreak and uh, having to deal with the uh, ongoing terrorist threat, ultimately there is going to be a significant impact on the preparedness uh, of the security forces and should we be concerned about this? Anybody can come in. Right. Uh, I mean, yes, Raf, Raf touched upon it. Uh, 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 the world is closed. Uh, economy is shrinking. Uh, uh, your resources uh, is base is narrowing. So you need to optimize. You know, you need to utilize your resources uh, smartly. Uh, so you need to see where the public pressure is, uh, and if that is the case then definitely some funding is going to go away from counterterrorism into other fields. Uh, but then, as I said, uh, we need to think about uh, more imaginative and cost-effective ways of ensuring that counterterrorism policies and practices continue. Uh, how do we do that? Maybe public-private partnership is one way of doing it. Uh, the other way is like, you know, creating those alternate, alternative narratives wherever you can expose the terrorist narrative of uh, exploitation, of manipulation, of opportunism. Uh, I think those things can continue, uh, but for that you need to have a resilient society. But this question is definitely out there. I think uh, terrorism will become a tier four, tier five uh, level uh, priority for different governments. And uh, these other issues of human security, economic and health security, they are going to come up Yeah, in the non-traditional security sphere. That's right. right. Yeah, I very briefly add, I think uh, Bas is exactly right. I think the resource question is done. But I think there's an interesting question where I think at the moment, in fact, there is some evidence in some countries, you know, resources deployed previously to deal with counterterrorism being redeployed to deal with this, uh, to deal with sort of COVID response. But interesting, you also hear anecdotes that apparently um, security forces are finding this a more useful. <laughs> you know, the fact that so many people are being obliged to be locked in uh, means that, you know, terrorist suspects are also obliged to be locked in. And if they start wandering out, then it's very easy for security forces to go pick them up because there's no one else out on the street. So in some ways, I think it has kind of rendered, you know, the track and trace of individual terrorists probably a little bit easier in some contexts. But I think in other contexts, you know, it has meant security resources have been reallocated. The question is when lock-in ends, uh, when we see the world starting to move back towards normality, but the general pendulum of how people assess terrorist threats has shifted because people are now so much more concerned about pandemic threats, that does mean that the kind of larger resources to really deal with problems at root will be very difficult to mobilize. I think it will always be relatively easy to mobilize sort of, you know, the sharp end of the spear, the guys who go kick down doors, arrest cop, arrest bad guys, you know, disrupt networks that are about to do an attack. But the point is, if you want to stop that, you've really got to stop the part that's where these people are starting and how they're getting to there. And I think that part is going to be very difficult to mobilize large resources to uh, deal with. Right. Thanks. Uh, uh, anybody else want to chip in on this? Uh, no, there's a, another question I, I just saw uh, about the, okay, the, well, this, I believe we may have touched on this slightly, uh, earlier on, but uh, unlike previous crises, COVID-19 can't bring the US and world order together. So uh, it, it, it's something which I think is a good way to kind of like begin the process of slowly wrapping up our discussion. So uh, I'll ask the panel, what do you think uh, is likely to be the, uh, the, the impact of this uh, COVID-19 in terms of uh, 
uh, multilateral cooperation in the counterterrorism sphere? I mean, do you feel that uh, uh, there's going to be this this uh, outbreak will give an impetus to such cooperation, or do you actually see that it, it's uh, going to be the opposite case? And and well, what do you think? All right. I I fear it's going to be the opposite case, I'm afraid. I think that we're moving into a world where competition is becoming um, the kind of accepted norm um, and it's being pushed forwards in a very uh, pointed and aggressive way. I'd even, you know, I'd even say Afghanistan, um, I'm telling you something on Bassett's turf here and hope you'll forgive me. You know, I think we'll, we'll present itself as an interesting case study of this because previously we'd actually seen the US and China cooperating in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that cooperation has fallen by the wayside and I struggle to see it getting picked up again. And I think if you, you know, in, in a country like Afghanistan, which is, you know, one that's had long standing problems where frankly China will have to play a role in whatever future the country has given sort of geography. Um, you know, I, I think I struggle to see how the US and China are even gonna be able to cooperate there. Um, and I think if that's the case, I struggle to see how we'll see that cooperation playing out in lots of different contexts. And I think in a Southeast Asian context, the concern has to be a kind of tug of competition that you end up getting between the US and China and how that might spill over into this space. And you know, for the US and China in, in Southeast Asia, it's really a question of working with partners, trying to mobilize partners. And it's gonna be difficult, I think, to get you know, the security forces in a country like the Philippines you know, to get support from both China and America at the same time. Um, they will find themselves in a difficult situation and potentially being pushed uh, into choosing in something they don't really want to do. And so I actually think that there's a possibility that we're gonna see you know, the sort of grand coalitions uh, spanning the world that we saw in the past, much harder uh, to mobilize um, to deal with uh, terrorist threats. How about uh, any of the other two? Um, yes, I mean, just briefly, um, I mean, geopolitics uh, directly impacts uh, terrorism and terrorist trends. Uh, the way geopolitics evolve, terrorist group and their tactics evolve uh, accordingly. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, as America is withdrawing, uh, so Zalme Khalilzad, uh, the special representative of uh, uh, the State Department, uh, went to India and uh, uh, the Trump administration wanted India to play a bigger role in Afghanistan now when the U.S. is leaving. Now, uh, that leaves the question open in terms of how Pakistan and China are going to react to that. So it only adds to the problem, doesn't really solve the problem. Also, because as, as Raf said that uh, America is leaving Afghanistan. Uh, so, you know, for global jihadists, they always need a big enemy. Uh, earlier, Russia was the big enemy, then America was the big enemy. But once the big enemy is gone, then there is space for smaller and regional groups to do their militancy. Uh, but not really space for global militants to do their militancy. So uh, I think uh, uh, we are entering an era where uh, while uh, these groups are not going to get a lot of resistance, but then they're not going to get much of audience as well. They may be able to reclaim some of the space, uh, but because of this great power competition, because uh, those, those, the, th the attention would move away from them, uh, that might localize a lot of movements as well. So I think at least in the South Asian theater, I see weakening of global jihadism, but a reinvigoration of local and regional militancy in South Asia. Yes. Uh, Azima, any uh, yeah, I think I think both uh, Raf and Basit took it uh, very well. Um, but the way I see it, like um, in, in any case, uh, like I see it is still going to capitalize and exploit uh, the the weakening of uh, international cooperation and so on. So, <clears throat> so we, I guess, in a way, we should um, like brace ourselves for perhaps um, the continuation of of this local insurgent uh, violence and and international terrorism to miss. I don't know. Maybe get worse um, if the international corporations and so on that has been in place in the past are broken down or disrupted. Um, so yeah, um, I guess we we all should remain uh, vigilant and 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 try to uh, try to handle this as best as we can. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, well. Uh...
I think we have uh, come to the, uh, unfortunately, the end of our discussion, our webinar. I'd <clears throat> like to uh, say that uh, personally, I found it a very rich uh, discussion. Uh, many issues have been touched on, and certainly one thing we can take away is that uh, certainly the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak has uh, caused a lot of uh, us in the analysis community to put on our, think put on our thinking hats and uh, figure out uh, what's uh, next for the counterterrorism space. Uh, I believe that what my colleagues have raised uh, this afternoon has uh, generated a lot of ideas on the part of the uh, audience, and I hope that you found this very beneficial as, as I did. Uh, please uh, bear with us uh, as we, you know, in the COVID-19 uh, situation, we have had to go online a lot, and uh, there, there may have been some teething issues in terms of uh, today's uh, uh, webinar. So please bear with us. We'll try and sort it out for, for future uh, sessions. And anyway, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, my colleagues, Raf, Asit, and Azima for uh, sharing their ideas with us. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us as well. And uh, I hope to see you at a future RSIS event. So with that, uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank, thank you. you.